for some wine tasting. Nice, crisp, a nice alternative to Chardonnay or Pinot Gris. side as you can see pretty steep and this the area known for its soil area the red clay soil called the jewelry soil which is the original volcanic soil in the area not impacted by the Missoula floods which mm. flooded the whole valley 10,000 years ago mm -hmm. um, um, it's a cool site it gets shaded here in the afternoon and it gets the morning sun which is great for Pinot Pinot mm. is not one of those great that like the heat it actually won't taste good if it's too hot. Definitely won't grow well in Florida, I can tell you that. No, nothing <laughs> with, would grow there. I have a vineyard over there where the black house is. I don't own the land, I lease it. Land owned by a Italian guy. He lives in Tampa, believe it or not. Mm. Oh, okay. And he was hoping to retire here someday, but unfortunately, the poor guy is legally blind at this point. He's been losing his sight over the years. He's only 62 years old, my age. Wow. And so he has it on this. You want to buy it? It's for sale. He's selling it. Over there, I planted three acres of chard and five acres of pinot. We're gonna try both wines from that vineyard. I buy fruit from three other vineyards in the area. One of them is Red Hill Estate, right up here, owned by Archery Summit. Winderley Vineyard on the other side of the hill, about a mile from here. Um, and basically, 90% of my fruit comes within walking distance. The only exception is Britain Vineyard, 20 mile that direction in the McMinnville AB. I don't own a garage anymore. I tore it down, put a winery's place mm. right here. Everything made here since 2011. I do a couple thousand cases a year, but lately, uh, Mother Nature hasn't been kind. We had all, everything went wrong in 2020, including COVID. But we had fire, smoke, 
high wind, rain the wrong time, you name it. So I ended up making four wines instead of 12. I ended up making one Pinot Noir instead of seven. Mm. Gosh. And this year we got hit with frost in the late spring. And I lost 30, 40 to about 40% of my crop in this winter. Mm. And we basically, practically, we didn't have a spring. We went from spring, from winter, which lasted till end of June this year, mm. till summer, right after Labor Day weekend. I mean, uh, Memorial Day? No, 4th of July. 4th of July. Mm. That's what happened when you get old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're not gonna harvest for at least two, two and a half weeks, probably. Start harvesting. I'll probably go on for a couple of weeks after that. Will you tell them about you? I'll be happy to. <laughs> well, if you want to sit down first, have some wine, sure. and we can talk about me. Sure. That's why they have the food. Yeah. What's the significance with the name of your vineyard on the glass? So, I'm originally Lebanese. I grew up in Lebanon. I came here in 1981 to escape the war and uh, finish up college. And uh, oh. so, Ayub is my last name. Oh, okay. And mm. It's the Arabic word for Job, Prophet Job. Mm. Have you read your Bible? Prophet mm. Job, yes. Mm -hmm. Job. They're all glazed. They're always talking about Job. <laughs> no, <laughs> Job. Known for patience. Yes. Mm. So it fits the trade, actually, the name. Yeah, I, uh, I got accepted in Columbia University in New York and Wash U in St. Louis. So I opted for Wash U in St. Louis because of cost of living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was poor and I'm still poor. <laughs> <laughs> the bank owns this, I don't. Um, <laughs> you just a worker, baby? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I uh, studied engineering at WashU, had three degrees in engineering, and uh, worked there a couple of years, and then moved to the East Coast with my ex wife. So, I uh, am in the DC area for about 10 years. I quit to hiatus from engineering and up at cooking school in New York. And I came back to DC and cooked for my favorite Northern Italian restaurant for about three years. And I engineered on my day off just to make some money because there's no money in cooking, it's just like wine making. Sure. Mm -hmm. So eventually I got an offer, I couldn't refuse to go back to engineering and I did. On the premise, save some money and open a restaurant someday. I'm still saving some money to open a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of I've got this other money pit over here. Uh, what else? Along the way, I quit that job, then I ended up moving to California, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, basically, with a 97, with a new job. And back in 99, they asked me to come up here work on a project for three months. Stayed in a hotel, explored one country here. I met a lot of people. Um, being friends with wine and the, and the wine business here. And then the company I worked for asked me to move up here, transition the division here, move my engineering team and the product I was working on here. I said, this is my own. He said, okay, we'll twist. They so twisted and end up here. Bottom line, I wanted to live in wine country. It just fell in my lap very quickly, actually. Nice. Just things happen in life you don't expect. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know me, I'm enthusiastic. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. We did. So, O one, I cleared the land. O four, start making wine. Back then, I only made one wine until 2009. Started making Chardonnay out of a single vineyard Pinot and a blend called Memoirs. And from there, I expanded. Uh, you know, I tried one of my expansion wines at the end, which is a very special wine. Uh, start making in 2014, which is my estate 100% focus. Mm. Back in 2005, the story is not finished yet. Back in 2005, I quit my job here. I got another job back in the Bay Area. Start commuting. 11 years. Mm -hmm. Monday to Friday there, Friday to Monday here, on the plane every week. Mm -hmm. So I did 
both the job full time down there and full time up here. Take care of this in case the thunder club, you name it. 2016, I ended up in the hospital. I decided to keep this, quit the job. Oh, that's my story. I'm staying. You just leave these tanks. These are the fermentation tanks. Okay. And there's more to come. There's actually will be tanks where you stand. So it will be full. And all the wines will be fermenting here during harvest. We'll crush the, the crush pad is outside the store. There's the stemmers, press, sorting table, all that stuff is out here. And in the winter, after all the wine, the, the fermentation done and the wine in barrels, all barrels. There's another room over there, catty corner from here. All these barrels are empty. There's no wine in them because I just bottled my 21. So when I do my 22s here shortly, after the fermentation is done and they settle in tank, you transfer them to barrel. Inoculate it more. We collect the yeast while we're uh, while we're harvesting and grow it in carboids, and that's what we use to re-inoculate the wine. Our wines do say that uh, they have sulfites on them on the bottles, but it is natural occurring sulfites coming out of the vineyard. Uh, our certification allows us one hundredth per million of a sulfite in our wine, and we're at 30, so we're one of the lowest ones. The concrete dolly, we now have two of them. And if you reach inside, on this side, you can feel that it's rough concrete on the inside. And then it has the pointy end on the bottom, so you can feel how rough it is in there. Can everybody get in front of us a picture, y'all? has a rough interior. Rough. Whereas those are smooth inside. And just leaves the skins left. Okay? So then we just have all this. So then all the juice comes down into the bottom there.
Um, so Mo was actually born in Iran. He went to college in Texas at Arlington for civil engineering. Worked at TGI Fridays the whole time, 40 hours a week, just to put himself through school. He did it, he got his civil engineering degree, and he moved back to put that degree to use in his hometown of Tehran. He soon met his wife, Flora, they got together, and then they were with child, and then all of a sudden the regime change had happened. And so his family actually grew grapes in Iran. His father would turn them into wine and his father would grow the grapes back when, uh, back when biodynamic farming just meant farming. And so when the regime change happened, all of the vineyards were tore out, burned, and so his family vineyard was gone. And then a lot of people had uh, changed the way that women's rights were. And so his wife and his soon-to-be daughter were going to enter into this nation in this new regime with little to no rights. And so they decided to make their escape. And so they went by motorcycle while Flora was eight months pregnant with their first daughter, Tamine. And they went across the mountains until they hit a checkpoint where they had to ditch the motorcycle and sprint across the border zone while Flora was eight months pregnant. And uh, they made it across. They made it to Spain where they were given refugee status, but they wanted citizenship somewhere. So what they did is they uh, actually made their way down into Mexico and most still had some friends in Texas from college. So they went through customs up into Texas. They finally made it to America where they were able to get citizenship and uh, they spent their first night in Texas on a freshly rug doctored floor that was still wet with nothing uh, in their possession, all of their assets frozen. So they literally slept on their jackets that night on a wet floor with their newborn child. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went from that to 532 acres in the valley with 260 acres of fruit, all biodynamic. And so for anyone who doesn't know what biodynamic means, uh, biodynamic means that we don't do any um, added sugar. We are completely chemical free in our vineyard and in our winery. And in addition to that, uh, we also use 100% native local yeast. There are no commercial yeasts used in any of our wines. And that's being biodynamic. It's the way that wine was made for millennia before the Industrial Revolution. We think it's the best for our bodies, for our environment, and for our wine to do it that way today. So we've got a couple of different options for you. We've got the standard tasting flight, which if it's your first time here, I definitely recommend. Um, if you guys just want to do a glass, you can do a glass pour of any of the wines on the tasting flight. That's a five ounce pour. And if you guys also want it, you can split bottles at the table. We can't do tastings from the buy the bottle section because it's a lot of library stuff that you, can only, you can't get out of market. You can only get it here as a club member. And uh, yeah, so those are our wine options today. Are y'all game to do the flights sure. and try everything? Yeah, sure. So sure. why don't we do the normal tasting? Perfect. Uh, one one is I know, because I, I had a bunch of girlfriends uh, about two or three years ago, mm -hmm. and we were all supposed to come. Next, we should just be able to in, get in, in two in hours. Hours. and then you are all set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lot. Two Pinot Gris and one Pinot Blanc.
Oklahoma, the only licensed to Oklahoma in the state of Oregon. Lemon and peach. There's still people that cannot believe we can actually grow olive trees. That's all they do. Mm. Oregon. No, we're, mm -hmm. you know, it's typically grown in uh, nice hot climates like in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and uh, you know, South America and obviously Northern Africa. But we, uh, we did a crazy thing back in 2004. We planted 17 acres of olive trees. Now, the first two years of having olive trees were, were kind of a challenge. We lost them. Hundreds and hundreds of the first two winters. There's over 2,000 varietals of olive trees in the world. We found about seven that are hard enough to grow here. So after we kind of figured out through trial and error what will grow here, we built the only licensed commercial olive mill in 2008. And ever since we've been making really high quality extra virtual olive oil, we have a whole shelf full of trophies in there that test the quality of the world. specify that because uh, all the wines are bottled unfiltered and unfined, meaning that you're truly getting a snapshot of what that vineyard gave us in that vintage. We do no manipulation in the cellar as far as enzymes used or anything like that to extract color, flavor, fruit profile, those type of things. Age it out in barrel, let it settle out in barrel, then very delicately move it into blending tank and then bottle the wine. Mm -hmm. River Best Western. It's a restaurant with river views. This is Grace. It's my, my granddaughter. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. And Grace will uh, take care of you. And this is named after Grace, isn't it? Uh, this is Pope Ranch. Pope, Pope. Pope Ranch. And that Pope was the, uh, was the name oh, used in uh, Ivy's family. And uh, it's her See. middle name, actually. Okay. And they also gave the name to Olivia, their, lo their youngest daughter. Uh, Olivia Hope. Olivia Hope. Nice. Olivia. Wow. So that kind of permeates through the 
tradition. Nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. How big of a property do you have? It's 25 acres in total. Okay. It goes all the way down the backside of the west to the bottom of the hill. And this is all his, too. It's my son's place. Yeah. And it goes, uh, if you were to go up on the top of that rise, you would see those tree lines. You would see more property that is his beyond the trees a little bit. There's a fence line separating the next property. And then there's a stream that runs down, pretty good sized stream that runs down in the, in the mm. hollow. Wow. And then there's a little stream that comes down right here at the end of the rows that you see the rows end there. And there's a little road. And so there's a couple streams they run through and you have to let them keep going. So that's wow. the rule, you know, you can't block them. Uh, you can create a pond, but we didn't need a pond. So right. in fact, they used to have a pond over there. They filled it in. <laughs> They have oh, what a beautiful pipe, piece of so. property. Yeah, it's 25 acres, and we got cows over there on the other that field. That was my question. question yeah. Got about 12, 15 cows. Okay. And they do uh, raise them for slaughter. Okay. Uh, uh, and, uh, what kind of cows? You know, I don't know okay. the the species of the breed before this was all in. You're gorgeous. Uh, He's a beautiful cat. Trailers and RVs all along here, but it, now it's got this in here, so it's a little different. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the little field cats. Keep the critters under control. Yep. Oh, the beautiful. To, uh, a clean operation is have several cats. You've got three. You have uh, deer here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were looking at in yeah. Florida. Yeah. Deer. Surprises for you because it's fall and the grapes are full glory. Right. You definitely want to go out and check the vineyards. But I'm going to bring you inside and give you a little uh, where the restroom is, and then I'll kind of gather you together and we'll talk about where you want to sit. And what you want to do. But you're going to be happy to know we make this just like the Chardonnay. So if you're a Chardonnay fan, you're going to love the white. Oh, okay. Yeah, right <laughs> 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 and I'll go get a little duck bucket just in case. I might maybe put one here and then one towards the out of that. There's some copper no less. Do you not want you that's want something fine, bigger? That's fine. I just I, oh, the buckets are taller. Thank you. That's all right. That's a lot of work. I don't, I don't think there's gonna be that much dumped out. No. <laughs> so Pinot Gris. A lot of folks come by here and go, I want a Pinot Grigio, and I'm like, oh, well, ours is Pinot Grigio. Well, I want a Pinot Grigio. And like, it's the same grape. It's just a lot of Italy, okay? <laughs> Hello <Yeah>. there. <laughs> so this vineyard over here that I'm facing is all Pinot Gris. But what I was going to say is Pinot Gris is probably the most consumed white wine in the entire state of Oregon. Really? It's, it's all stainless steel. Uh, it's dry. Ours is fruit forward nice and crisp. Some Pinot Gris give off some kind of, I've had some that taste a little metallic or kind of tinny, but ours is a really nicely balanced with the fruit and everything. And some people think it's sweet, it's bone dry. But people mistake 
fruitiness or sweetness. This is not sweet. There's no residual sugar. I love dogs. I have a bumper sticker that says, I just want to rescue dogs and drink wine. Nothing wrong with that. like the way you think. Guilty lady here. So this isn't on your list, but I wanted to talk to you about the famous pear wine. You're on the Fruit Loop here. And because you're not on a detail, you know, where you have to be out of here in 20 minutes or whatever, I got trained people that go, we have 10 minutes to drink wine. Give us the fastest that we can. Uh, we don't uh, use our pears for this. We're on the Fruit Loop. So I had an artist design a painting in there of an old fruit box label. These pears are just from across the street over there, one of need is chip factory. If any of you probably haven't heard of Juanita's, but it's a chips, and it's like crap. You can't stop eating them. But they don't have a retail outlet over there. Um, what is that? Oh, it's the, the throwing out of water, and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, the water's kind of forced. Mm -hmm. Maybe some little kids plugged it up yesterday. We call them water trolls. <laughs> play in my fountain and make mud pies. Oh, so we decided it would be really fun to make a pear wine considering we're on a fruit loop. So this is made with Pomise pears. It's very delicate. It's very delicate and I will tell you it's only nine and a half percent alcohol and one percent residual sugar. So very little sweetness. But I wanted to slide that in if anybody wants to try it before we do the rosé. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. And it's got a list top and it retails for twenty dollars a bottle. Mm. I this is so, it's, you know, I, I've served it with a butternut squash soup. Pear wine. Pumpkin bisque. It's a great toasting wine, brunch wine. Mm, it's very different. It should be served cold. I mean, it's very cold. It's fun. And it's not sweet, I like it. People surprise themselves because they like it. This is so nice. This is really nice. Not a strong pear flavor. Yeah. Yes. Refreshing, good for a nice hot day. So what's your review? Uh, <laughs> honey, we would like it. What would we like it with? A lovely piece of quiche. A quiche. Oh, for breakfast. Would, with a, would, a breakfast with a quiche. Okay. Yeah. That's a, a, nice big cin a nice big cinnamon bun. Fortified <laughs> Pinot Noir. So it's our Pinot Noir, stay Pinot Noir. And it takes six years to make. And yeah. it sits in the barrels and then we blend it with distilled spirits. goes back in the barrels for a couple of years. And then it is put into bottles. Uh, and uh, that's it. That's it. It's, uh, it's fortified. It's still spirits. 19% alcohol. <coughs>
probably. What, this is like the skinniest bridge? Oh, yeah. It, it is skinny. Oh, my this gosh. Is skinny. It is skinny. The other one makes me even more nervous, though. Oh, goody. It's got the grates that take you all over the place, too, right? She yeah, just, and she's got this like big, huge van. Oh, wow, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a no brainer. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, there's not a lot of room for Earl. Oh one. God, we're going look to get this big stuff. Oh, and there's a big truck. I can't look. Oh, I see. There's a big truck. Oh, 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 the river into Oregon, which divides the state. Do, do the love each other picture. Oh, well. 